Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is James Franco, and I'm a team member of FUSS Partners, a program of Focused Ultrasound Foundation that is dedicated to accelerating the commercialization of Focused Ultrasound. Today's webinar topic is Patent Strategy for Business Leaders. Our speaker, Rick Hamilton, will be providing a patent strategy overview intended to instruct how to mitigate certain types of business risks and leverage innovation investments. The goal of this webinar is to help, help answer the following questions. Why patent, what to patent, and how to patent. With expertise in cloud, Internet of Things technologies, and artificial intelligence, Rick Hamilton is an Optum Vice President and Senior Distinguished Engineer, and formerly the most prolific inventor in IBM history. He is currently recognized as the 14th most prolific inventor in world history with over 1,000 issued U.S. patents. Rick now works broadly across United Health Group's strategic imperatives, including machine learning, genomics, blockchain, Internet of Things, and cybersecurity to help people live healthier lives and make healthcare, healthcare work better. He's a graduate of the University of Tennessee, Southern Methodist University, and the University of Texas. It goes without saying that we are very fortunate to have Rick leading this webinar today. But before we get started, a few technical items. If your connection is lost, please simply log in again to the link you received when you registered. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you will receive a link to the webinar recording as well. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit it any time via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will collect these questions and answer as many as possible during the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rick. Rick, the floor is yours. Thank you, James, for that introduction. And uh, folks, it is great to be here today. Normally, we'd be doing this in person, uh, but consider this the at-home COVID edition of what you need to know as a business leader or as a technologist about patent strategy. So a, uh, a few words about me. Uh, I'm a named inventor on just right around 1,000 issued U.S. patents. Arguably of equal relevance is the fact that I've spent over 25 years working in and around uh, innovation and IP roles. Uh, I've spent a lot of time working to build portfolios and also using portfolios as well as creating the tools and institutions needed to do both. We're going to cover several topics today. Uh, we're going to start by providing some context and introduction to the overall topic of patents. And then we're going to drill into some specific strategic approaches. In each of these cases, we address the questions of, of why patent and what to patent. The reality here is that the answer is going to be different for each of these, depending on your, your business strategy and what the business needs you to do. From there, we'll arguably move into the tactics a little bit and talk about best practices. Here, we'll give both some generalized advice, but also enterprise advice as well. And uh, we'll finally wrap it up with some uh, closing thoughts and some Q&A. So let's begin with stepping back and looking at the big picture question, why do patents matter? And the reality is that in 99% of professions, patents matter little to our day-to-day -day concerns. But if you are investing in technical innovation, then patents become critically important because we see this technology revolutionizes vertical sector after vertical sector. Patents are increasingly relevant in industries where they might have been unimportant in past years. The past two decades, we've seen retail and distribution disrupted, transportation, finance disrupted. We now see those same disruptions playing out in healthcare. And with each technical advance, the same patent concepts that played out between pure play tech companies also become relevant to new industries and new sets of companies. So let's think about banking for just a moment. Banks used to compete on the basis of interest rates and retail locations. Uh, but increasingly, technology is a differentiator for banks. Uh, just late last year, late 2019 and early 2020, uh, USAA won over $300 million in court judgment for patent infringement against Wells Fargo. And my friends in banking recently told me there's a chance that this amount may be trebled because of willful infringement. That's $900 million in outlays. Uh, and so uh, this is a very serious topic. And over time, many companies that previously didn't really think about patents have begun to realize that they need a patent strategy. And it's not just about established companies either. If you do a Google search on patent horror stories, you'll see story after story of startups 
uh, who either you know, unnecessarily constrained their business or, or otherwise lost out because they didn't think about this topic soon enough. If you're investing in technology and, and innovation, then this is something that you can probably ignore for months or maybe even years. But it's like walking through a minefield. You're betting your company. And what I want to cover today are ways for you to hedge your business risk and to better leverage your strength. So uh, with that, what am I offering and what am I not offering? I am offering business advice on the choices that you might decide to make uh, and drawn from my lengthy experience in a variety of innovation and, and IP roles. Uh, I'm not offering legal advice. I'm a technologist and a business leader. I'm not an attorney. Uh, I'm not going to address filing jurisdiction strategies or litigation strategies or any of the other countless ways you can unpack this subject. I'm also not going to give you information on UHG's patent strategy, my employer, or make any representation of UHG's positions on these matters. Rather, I'm speaking as, as Rick Hamilton, an individual. Uh, today, I'm not going to give you many definitive answers. Instead, my goal is to give you a lot of questions and a lot of considerations that you can then use to address your particular business needs. So at the most general level, patent strategy should follow your business strategy. You should file patents if your business dictates that you do so. If you tell me that uh, your business needs you to prevent others from copying products, that determines your patent strategy. If you tell me your business needs you to monetize your patents, that determines your patent strategy. If you tell me that you want to serve, soothe the nerves of investors with patents, I'll say, fine, that's your ultimate goal, but how are you going to do so? In other words, how are you going to use patents to accomplish that objective? So uh, always, always, always make sure that your patent strategy is closely tied to what the business is trying to accomplish. But first, let's step back and do a little bit of a level set. To get a patent, an invention must be new, useful, and non-obvious. These all have specific legal meanings, so consult your attorney on this. But from my business perspective, new means both chronologically new and original. You can't patent what somebody else has already thought of and publicly disclosed. In the United States, you have 12 months to file a patent application once your invention has been publicly disclosed. Uh, useful means it provides some identifiable benefit and it's capable of being used. You can't patent uh, a concept or an abstract principle. Non-obvious, my attorney friends will tell you that it means a person of ordinary skill in the art wouldn't necessarily think of your invention. Uh, I'm an engineer, right? So for me, non-obvious means it has this gee whiz factor to it. You look at it and you say, wow, that's, that's a pretty slick solution. Then it might pass this test. If you look at something and shrug your shoulders and say, I've seen this before many times, it probably doesn't pass that non-obvious test. One other thing I would advise is to define business use cases for your chosen strategy. And anything you file should ultimately fulfill one of these business use cases. The business use cases provide a foundation, almost like a constitution for your efforts, which later on, if you're thinking, should we file this? particular invention, you go back and look at those use cases and ask yourself, does it fulfill one of those use cases? If the answer is yes, then you consider filing it. With that, what are the four most common patent strategies we see in technology companies today? Well, uh, the level that we're going to go through or the order that we're going to go through these is as follows. We see often companies with no discernible strategy. From there, we see companies who are trying to mitigate copying. We see companies pursuing freedom of action, and we see companies pursuing outbound licensing. Now, the truth is there are also other reasons to patent, but they're often secondary, and they generally don't drive your decisions. Uh, these decisions could be, or these reasons could be, projecting external brand image as an innovator, or maybe you want to project that image back internally, you know, filing to keep your employees happy. Uh, and that's fine. This may be valid. But if you want to file patents to keep your researchers happy, you don't need my advice. Instead, let's just remember that these four approaches provide a sweeping overview of what's either implicitly or explicitly in place of technology companies today. So with that, let's look at each one of these and see what these uh, approaches entail. Let's begin with companies that have no discernible patent strategy. So companies uh, that pursue no strategy, why would they even talk about this? We, we talk about this because, frankly, it seems to be the most common practice in place today. And this approach, approach manifests itself in, in multiple ways. 
some companies might believe that patents are irrelevant, or some companies might think, well, they, they probably have some relevance, but we have no idea what to file or what to do with them. So these companies could make an overt decision to simply not file patents, or they could file periodic patents without thinking through the end usage. No end game has been articulated in this case. What gets patented? What gets filed with no discernible strategy? These companies are patenting without forethought. Uh, they may file some patent through Brownian motion. Random ideas get filed, but these can be disjointed. Friction can exist, so, uh, for instance, uh, funding mechanisms. Imagine you've got two development teams, either because of leadership preferences or because of departmental finances. One team files patents while the other one doesn't. And as a result, you have these gaps that occur. Maybe unimportant components are being protected while important ones are not. It's probably no big surprise, but this approach is not an option uh, if your company is doing innovative work. Uh, we said you should define business use cases that support your strategy. Frankly, I cannot help you define business use cases if you decide to pursue this approach. Your company may have started here, and that's okay. A lot of companies do. But as your business environment and as the technologies evolve, your patent strategy should also evolve over time. So with that, let's move on. So from there, we want to talk about mitigating copying, and this is fairly easy to wrap our head around. Uh, the truth is that when you try to mitigate copying, you begin to create business value. Why do companies choose to, to pursue this approach? Well, the reasons are fundamental to the existence of the U.S. patent system. If your company is making investments, taking risks to push the boundaries of science and technology, you want to maintain sole rights to practice your invention. Rather than simply running faster than your competitors, now you're beginning to place hurdles in their path to protect your investments. This is the simplest strategy to understand and execute, and it's often a great place to begin. So what might you patent if you're following this approach? Well, mitigating, patent, I'm sorry, mitigating copying implies that you identify your key differentiators and ensure that those are protected. Uh, I'd urge you to consider your unique functions, features, your capabilities that are delivering value for your company. This is, again, as we said, where most startups begin. Uh, and you begin to look at use cases like how can you protect your revenue sources? How do you, how do you create barriers to entry? You know, can you protect elements that your competitors would need to enter a market? Uh, can you create or can you patent innovations to reduce cost or to create efficiencies? Do you have inventions that offer new user experience improvements? Uh, you may have other business use cases beyond this. But if you say our strategy is to mitigate copying and to inhibit commoditization, then identify the use cases that are relevant to your company, and that's where you begin to file patents. So from that, we'll move to a, a more complex solution, a more complex approach, that's often used by enterprises, by large corporations, called freedom of action. And freedom of action is all about mitigating risk. So the questions, of course, are, you know, what does freedom of action mean and why do companies pursue it? Freedom of action refers to the ability of a company to sell solutions in the marketplace. It's often a superset of the last approach. You may seek to mitigate copying, but now you take your efforts one step further. Freedom of action means having enough patents or enough cross-licenses cross so that you have the ability to launch products and that you're comfortable with your patent infringement risk. There is this uh, implicit recognition that you can't clear all the patents needed for your products, and so instead you, uh, you either seek uh, licenses preemptively or often very common, you mitigate risk by seeking the ability to counter assert patents against aggressors who often are your competitors. So let's, let's Put this into a little bit more, uh, more relief if we could. We're trying to mitigate risk by seeking leverage over others in our ecosystem. Uh, it's a common enterprise strategy practiced by large tech companies, but it can also be expensive. Uh, large tech companies may receive hundreds or even thousands of issued patents a year. Why do they do this? Is it because they like to waste money? Of course not. They do so in recognition that all innovations are built on other foundational technologies. And to the degree that those foundational technologies are patented, it creates business risk for the new innovator. So let me give you a hypothetical example. Well, let's suppose that I have a competitor uh, in some technology-focused area. We'll call my competitor Neil. And it doesn't really matter what area we're in, but it's something to do with technology where we're, we're driving the boundaries of technology forward. So I'm investing in tech, but I'm not backing it up with a patent portfolio. One day, my competitor, Neil, knocks on my door and says, hey, Rick, your new solution is infringing my patent. 
what options do I have? Well, I pull my engineers and attorneys together in a room, and if behind closed doors we think, yes, we might be infringing Neil's patent, our, our options are very limited. We can take a legal approach and we can try to invalidate Neil's patent, uh, but that's a roll of the dice. You don't know what's going to happen there. So then we look at business options. Uh, firstly, I can take my product off the market. I can go to my competitor and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to sell it anymore, but I don't want to do that. Another option is I go to my competitor and I say, how much do you want for a license? I pull up my wallet. I give them tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, but I don't want to do that. A third option that I have is I ignore my competitor and I hope he goes away. But if he doesn't go away, if he pursues litigation, now things have gotten very serious because the fact is that if I go to court, I run the risk of willful infringement and the possibility of paying triple damages. And so these are all bad options. And the reason I have nothing but bad options is because I'm innovating without a portfolio. So freedom of action and the reason that these tech companies file so many patents recognizes, again, that I want the ability to counter a search. Now imagine that I have invested in technology, but I've also backed it up with a patent portfolio. My competitor comes at me. Now I go back to Neil and I say, okay, Neil, we're going to talk about your patent and my product, but we're also going to talk about these three patents of mine that read on two products of yours. Now I'm in a position of strength. Now we simply sign a cross-license agreement and we do business in the marketplace, which is where we want to be. And because I'm in a position of strength, if any money exchanges hands, it goes from my competitor to me. And so, again, this is freedom of action in a nutshell. So what business use cases might exist for freedom of action? Well, you might want to patent things that protect existing or planned revenue sources. Maybe you patent things that create white space for solutions that aren't yet on your roadmap, but you might want to offer in future years. You may patent solutions to, to gain leverage over existing or potential competitors, or you may try to improve terms and conditions or broader business negotiations. Again, you can define the business use cases if this is the approach that you want to pursue. So let's move to the fourth level of patent strategy, or the fourth different approach, and that is outbound licensing. And frankly, folks, everybody has this idea that they're going to file a couple of patents and they're going to make millions of dollars once those patents issue. But let me tell you, I hate to break this to you, it's not that simple. So outbound licensing is often pursued uh, because monetization is a direct part of your business strategy. You want to make money from your patents. But outbound licensing can also be used to force other business conditions. Uh, in truth, if you have patents that others need access to, uh, then you can use that to create business advantage. You can drive partnerships. You can affect other business terms. And this can be very powerful in its own right. Uh, regardless of whether you're seeking monetization or influence, your goal here is to license or assign patents. Uh, licensing means that you grant others the right to use your patent, and depending on the exclusivity terms, uh, you may license a patent multiple times. Uh, assignment means selling the patent to another party, and then they can use the patent uh, to do with as they wish. As you can probably imagine as well, uh, this approach, licensing, can be used alongside either of the last two approaches. Uh, finally, I have to say that many novice players uh, particularly overestimate their ability to license. In patent licensing, you get what you negotiate. So consider the use of an experienced licensing ex executive if you're going this route. Don't underestimate the level of nuance and complexity as you begin this journey. But look, this isn't a talk on a licensing strategy, so we'll save the details of that for another day. What gets patented if you decide that you want to pursue outbound licensing? Well, outbound licensing will only be successful if you understand your prospects, your licensing prospects, and their business interest, and then preemptively seek patents that they will need to license. Uh, it's a challenging strategy and requires a lot of consideration of your brand image, among other things. There's a lot of nuances that will determine what gets patented. Who are your prospective licensees? Where are they growing? What are their growth uh, objectives? Uh, does licensing exist alongside your own production, or are you looking to solely license? Are you pursuing carrot licenses or stick licenses? In other words, carrot licenses, are you cold calling to say, here's an opportunity for you to grow your business? Or stick licenses, are you, are you hoping to monetize by catching people infringing after the fact? So the business use cases here can define both the macroscopic areas to patent as well as specific topics to pursue. The broader the pool of licensing prospects means the broader the pool of subject matter. Am I, am I trying to license only my direct competitors? 
others in my ecosystem, or across a variety of sectors. Uh, bottom line, the things you're going to patent really are going to be determined by your own business strategy as well as the interplay of all these other factors around who your prospects might, might be. So let's briefly recap, right? So we talked about the fact that your business must drive your patent approach. So follow your business strategy. We talked about four common levels or four common approaches to patent strategy. Uh, so you're going to figure out the one that makes most sense for your business. Uh, recognize also this is a journey that takes years. Your views and approach can change over time. Uh, we see companies like Nokia that have gone through different strategies over decades, and they're now primarily monetization companies. Uh, we'd also note that the, the last value contributions on a company's asset sheets when, I, when they're liquidated are often patents. So it's easiest to begin with a highly defensive posture with your patents and then slowly move towards some form of monetization. The point is you should always have a strategy, and the strategies can change over time. So with that, let's shift gears a little bit and maybe arguably talk a little bit about tactics now and uh, specifically into how to patent with best practices. Some of you may plan to file only a handful of patents, and others among you might plan to make this part of your culture. So we want to address two broad topics. One is what we'll call universal best practices that everyone should undertake, regardless of whether you're filing one patent or a thousand. And from there, we'll go uh, briefly into enterprise best practices and tackle this question of how to make invention a repeat process. So first, let's hit on the, the best practices to consider regardless of your invention frequency. First of all, make sure you have a corporate IP policy in place. Uh, either put it in your corporate handbook or have a separately distributed IP policy document. And you really want to make sure that you've got clearly stated policies because this minimizes the chance that ownership questions arise. It's critical to get this right up front. And what you don't want is a patent issue, and you've got a, a researcher that's excited because they think they own the patent, and you're excited because you think you own the patent. No, put that groundwork in place up front so that when the patent application is filed and when it's issued, there's no question about ownership. Now, as you begin to think about what you should patent, I urge you to, to devolve the complex solutions. Because often, folks, we will develop complex solutions for the marketplace, and we'll think, I want to patent that. Uh, but you can help yourself uh, as you think about what to patent by uh, breaking this down into novel elements and then try to patent each one. If you tell me you just invented a new car and you want to patent the car, uh, I would ask you what's novel about it, and maybe you get separate patents on the adaptive cruise control or the improvements to the exhaust system or the fuel management processes. Uh, I was uh, Just before the pandemic began, I was in Dallas meeting at a startup, and um, somebody there, this was in February of this year, and somebody said, you know, I understand if I had invented some powerful solution like Google Maps, I know I could have patented that. And I said, stop. That's not the right way to think about this. If you've just invented Google Maps, I would suggest patenting the way that the mapping services ingest and display new businesses as those businesses are formed. I would patent the way that you identify and display nearby pharmacies or gas stations or grocery stores. I would patent the way that you calculate the route to your destination, and I would patent the way that you change the routing advice based on changing traffic conditions. Again, break your complex application down into finite components and make each of those the focus of your efforts. Now, a good attorney will help you do this, but if you think through it in advance, then guess what? Uh, that's going to involve a lot less of that attorney's time and be a lot easier on your wallet if you can preemptively devolve these complex solutions. And that leads us to another point. And that is that you want to create patent clusters. It's often easy for a competitor to work their way around one patent, but complex solutions often contain multiple distinct inventions, as we just saw. And so by filing multiple patents around a given solution, a competitor has a lot more difficult time uh, duplicating what you've accomplished. So talk with your attorneys about apparatus and method claims. Also consider all the permutations for your solution that you can imagine and include those as well. Because if you have a great solution, it might be possible to obtain multiple patents protecting various subcomponents of that product. And in doing so, you make life very difficult for your competitors. So another best practice as we think about um, you know, what we're going to patent is you should consider discoverability and avoidance. 
you know, could you detect infringement if others were using your invention? Uh, or is your uh, invention something that's buried in a black box deep inside your company that nobody from the outside world could ever tell what you were doing or how you were doing it? You know, if you have something that's easy, easily discoverable, uh, if you have something that is uh, that you can detect in a competitive solution by watching an operation or running test cases, uh, and you could infer the use of your invention, then it's highly desirable to patent it. If you would have to examine source code or otherwise reverse engineer a competitive solution, then you might want to think about keeping your idea as a trade secret instead. Uh, in terms of avoidance, also think about how easy would it be for your competitors to avoid your idea. Are there a lot of other good solutions in the marketplace today, or does your invention offer advantages that no other solution offers? Uh, something else, uh, once again, a good attorney will help you with, but you want to think about expanding your claims. Uh, you should be inspired by your work, but not limited to your work. And I want to give you a, a particularly poignant example from my own career history of this. Uh, when I was an early, uh, develop, uh, early in my career, when I was a developer uh, and an early inventor back in the 90s, uh, I filed a handful of patent applications that were pretty much based on my work. And uh, when I created the patent application w alongside an attorney, I really described the work that I was doing. It pertained to one particular operating system on one particular kind of hardware. And about 10 years later, I was given the job to try to use my company's patent portfolio. And I thought, maybe I can use my early patents. And I went back and I looked at them and I realized that I had unnecessarily put myself into a box because of the way that these patent applications had described my work. Because I described one particular uh, operating system on a particular kind of hardware, when in reality, some of the work was applicable to any kind of operating system on any kind of hardware. And I could have had a much broader patent than we actually uh, ended up with. So let me give you an example. If you have just invented Coffee Cup 1.0, uh, then this is a hardware device and you're thinking, well, you know what, I, I listened to this guy Hamilton talk, so I think maybe I should go off and try to patent my Coffee Cup 1.0. And so you sit down with your attorney and you describe a cup made from compressed paper, which is slightly conical in shape. It has smooth sides and in some embodiments may have a temperature resistant wax insert and you're very excited about this patent application that you're going to be filing. But then, because you remember Hamilton said to expand your claims, you think about Coffee Cup 2.0. Even though you've not prototyped it yet, even though you haven't created the proof of concept, uh, you can describe what it looks like. And it's made from ceramic. The sides are parallel, and it even has a handle on one side to prevent you from burning your hand on the hot liquid. And then talk to your attorney about actually patenting that one as well. Remember, you don't have to have written the code or created prototypes to file for a patent, but you should be able to describe a technically embodied methodology to get the desired results. So talk to your attorneys about this and expand your claims always. Speaking of attorneys, let me tell you, when you're deciding on what should be filed to protect your business interest, ensure that the business folks, the technical folks, and the legal functions are all at the table. Any one or two of these is insufficient. Legal should not unilaterally drive your filing strategy, but you won't be successful without strong legal guidance through this process. Finally, uh, on that point, also always use skilled outside counsel with expertise in your domain. Your brother-in-law, Ned, might be an attorney, but I wouldn't count on him being able to draft the specification and claims that give you your business results that you need. And even if Ned is a patent attorney, if his special, specialization is in an area different than your invention, you know, his specialization is in life sciences and your invention is an electronic device, ask his advice on who has expertise in your domain and always use counsel with that expertise. One other point I want to bring up, it's not directly related, related to your own patents, but it is a best practice as you begin marching down this path. And that is be very, very careful when discussing adversely held patents. Because you see, discussing other companies' patents creates the potential for financial risk because of willful infringement. And so emails discussing competitors' patents can, can, can create significant business risk for you and your company. Even confidential information may be discoverable if you get into litigation. So it's important to work with your legal team to minimize this risk. So earlier when we talked about outbound licensing, uh, I mentioned carrot licenses. Uh, and you know, carrot licenses are somebody just got a patent issue 
and they go start knocking on doors and say, hey, I've got some patents. They're great. I think you can make money off of them. Let me tell you, uh, uh, the financial risk of examining others' patents are one reason that savvy organizations do not entertain carrot licenses. If you come to me and say, hey, Rick, look at my patents, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. And the reason I turn you away is to limit my financial risk. If I look at your patents and decline a license, then my awareness of your patent may inhibit my ability to develop and deliver new solutions. So bottom line, be really careful when discussing others' patents and don't email anything about them that you would not want your competitors' attorneys reading, uncovering, and holding over your head in a court of law. So this is all kind of the universal best practices. But why do we think about or how do we think about patents if we want invention to be a repeat process? Well, as a company grows, you need to be able to establish a balance. We see larger companies often have this common journey. They realize that patents can advance their business interests, so they begin to encourage employees to contribute ideas to get employees excited about uh, patents. This leads to runaway spending, and so then they begin to implement cost controls. To repeatedly create meaningful patents and do the right thing by your business, you need both a motivated, skilled workforce, but also the right business controls in place so that the subject matter you need is patented. Uh, this dynamic balance is, is created and maintained through strong leadership in your company. So let's look at each of these uh, in, in sequence. So first of all, in terms of getting people excited, it's a bit of a cultural transformation. How do you enact this cultural transformation? Well, the fact is you need to raise awareness of, of IP's importance. You want to train your organization's key business and technical leaders, and you want to weave this narrative into leadership communications. Consider what venues are right for getting word out to say patents are important to this company. You also want to celebrate successful inventors and issued patents. Make this part of your culture. These might be articles in a company newsletters, photographs on a wall. There's a lot of other ways to recognize success, but putting the inventors on a pedestal helps encourage this repeat behavior. Consider award structures. Are you paying inventors for successful filings or issuances? And have you considered the non-monetary reasons for inventors to participate as well? My own experience, just anecdotally, is that it's often really easy to motivate an aspiring inventor uh, to file for her first patent, because, uh, regardless of financial awards. But if you want that inventor to come back and contribute ideas year after year, financial compensation provides an incentive to do so. Finally, ensure process transparency. Inventors whose ideas are closed, in other words, not filed, uh, will come back with new ideas only if they understand how and why the process worked out as it did. If you have inventors saying, uh, I think this should be patented, and leadership says, no, we're not going to file it without explanation, this lack of transparency is going to make a cultural transformation challenging, and it's going to inhibit, it will inhibit your portfolio growth over time. So these are all the ways to transform culture, ways to get employees excited about this. Now let's move to the business controls. What do you need to have in place? First of all, if you're going to be filing repeated patents, you need to have a disclosure form in place. This is a consistent way to effectively capture employee ideas, and also it, it's about asking the right questions uh, on the form. It allows you to assess those ideas in a uniform standard as well. Those completed forms are often sent to patent agents or outside counsel to prepare the patent application. So, so create an invention disclosure form that can be used repeatedly uh, as a business control. Something else to think about is some form of invention review board. Uh, you'll want, we talked about, uh, make sure the business, technical, and legal all have a seat at the table. You want subject matter experts to assess technical novelty and business value, and review boards will help determine what gets filed. I either look for reviewers with a major in technology and a minor in business, or somebody with strong business skills who can also speak a little tech. And a good mix of these folks together, a good mix of these perspectives, helps your company make, uh, make the best decisions. Set patent targets. These can be as simple as, as filing counts. We want to file 15 patents this year, whatever the number is. But it can also break out into other aspects, like technology areas or business functions. Uh, understand the factors important to your business and set guardrails. If you haven't thought through these targets, you're not going to know how well your portfolio is tracking your business interest. And on that front, you want to monitor, measure, and manage the pipeline. You want to view your invention pipeline like a deal progression pipeline and continually manage it to get the desired business results. 
Do you have certain emerging technologies or technical functions that are critical to your business? If those are underrepresented in your portfolio, you might have a problem. In that case, you need to stimulate inventions in those areas. Make sure, again, that the shape of the portfolio is closely tied to the shape of your business today and your business tomorrow. Finally, I'd urge you to streamline funding. You don't want cost, uh, tactical cost pressures determining what gets filed. Again, uh, you want to remove friction from the system so that the right ideas are filed without worrying about what Bob's budget or what Susan's budget is this quarter. Instead, make sure the best ideas have a funding source for them. So uh, most of today's audience I know is either in research or small to medium businesses. We haven't spent a whole lot of time on these enterprise enhancements, but I wanted you to understand this balance between culture and controls and the processes associated with each uh, so that if uh, you reach a point where invention processes become a recurring theme for your company, you have some idea of the direction that you need to head. So with that, let's begin to put a bow around this so that we can move to, uh, to question and answer. Uh, we talked about four levels of patent strategy, no discernible strategy, mitigating copying, freedom of action, outbound licensing. But now that we've walked through this, you know that the first is no longer an option for your business. You need to decide on your business goals and also what are those use cases that your portfolio should achieve. Remember that there's a lot of best practices here that should be followed when, uh, when patenting. Skilled counsel will help with this, but your awareness as business leaders and as technologists will help you develop a portfolio consistent with your business interest without breaking the bank. Um, folks, I have to say a successful patent journey uh, you know, follows business direction, reinforces the broader goals. It's a journey you start with an end in mind, but that end goal changes over time as business conditions evolve. Uh, be patient, have fun, and make sure you're always closely tied to the direction of technology and with business leadership. So with that, uh, I thank you for this. I'd like to open it up for questions, and I'd love to hear what's on your mind and where you'd like to take this conversation. Rick, thank you very much for your insightful and valuable presentation. We will now open up the webinar to Q&A. So our first question from the audience is, when is the right time for a small company to begin considering patent protection? And then related to that, when should a company engage IP attorneys? Well, the right time for a small company to engage uh, uh, outside counsel or uh, to begin considering patent protection is uh, is early in the process. And let me kind of peel these apart. So uh, if you have an idea to say that the market needs X, uh, that's usually too early to, to be considering patent protection. But if you say what the market needs is X, and we are going to achieve this by doing step one, step two, step three, step four, once you can begin actually laying out that technical embodiment, that technical process, that's often the time that you want to consider patent protection. Uh, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the, the early patent uh, once you know your approach. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the question on uh, engaging outside counsel, uh, it, it really depends. And uh, let, me, let me tell you why. There are different routes you can go here. If, if you engage outside counsel with a one-sentence description of what you want to accomplish, they are usually very happy to have that conversation because that means they're going to be spending many, many hours over the course of months working with you to evolve that one sentence description into something that can actually be carried forward as a patent application. If, however, you filled out an invention disclosure, if you know what you believe is novel, if you know what you want to patent, uh, if you do that before you engage counsel, then you will have, a, uh, I would say, a smaller legal bill uh, at the end of the day. So again, think about IP early. Uh, and when you engage counsel really depends on your level of sophistication and your level of comfort in fleshing out the idea on your own before you go to counsel, or do you want counsel involved every step of the way? Thank you, Rick, for that. Our next question uh, says, today you talked about regular patents, also known as utility patents. Should we consider other kinds of patents? Yes, and uh, the, the short answer is perhaps. So uh, to devolve this a little bit, there is a kind of application called a provisional application that we often consider. And a provisional application gives you no real legal rights, but what it does is provide additional time for you to file a regular or utility application. 
And so um, if you are about to go off and release something to the public, if you're about to offer it for sale, if you're about to talk about it at a conference, uh, your legal team, your, your attorneys can often get a provisional application on the books very, very quickly, sometimes in a matter of just a few days. And this allows you to maintain the legal rights to file the utility applications over time. Uh, there are other types as well. There are plant patents uh, if you're doing interesting work around plants. Uh, but something that may be relevant would be design patents. Design patents protect the look and feel of something. And this can be something as exotic as the uh, the look and feel of a, uh, the new iPad, or it can be the look and feel of a user interface. So uh, primarily technology companies focus on utility patents or regular patents, but there's definitely a time for provisionals along the way, and there's also uh, a need for occasional uh, design patents as well if you're concerned about protecting the physical appearance of something. Thank you, Rick. Our next question is, please explain the difference between a patent and copyright when it comes to software. Okay, and uh, again, I don't want to give legal advice, so talk to your attorney. Uh, but again, in my technologist way of viewing things, uh, the patent protects an underlying, uh, an underlying idea or underlying invention, whereas the copyright protects the particular manifestation or embodiment of that invention. So if I have a, an idea for a, a new software product, uh, I may uh, write that, I may go to one person and say, can you write this in uh, C++, I go to somebody else and say, can you write this in Python? Uh, that C++ embodiment or the Python embodiment, those are copyrighted works because those are representing the particular embodiment. However, the underlying idea uh, that is manifest in both of these copyrighted works or both these embodiments, that invention is what is patented. So think of the invention as being abstracted out from the particular embodiment. And the embodiment is copyrighted, whereas the, uh, the idea, as long as it's uh, surrounded by a technically embodied methodology, is what you actually patent. Thank you, Rick. Our next question asks, how would I know if someone else has already done what I'm thinking of patenting? Well, a very good question. So we talked about the risk inherent in uh, you know, emailing or, or spending too much time on adversely held patents uh, because you get yourself in trouble potentially for, for willful infringement. I often encourage inventors to simply spend uh, five or ten minutes out doing a quick search to figure out whether it's been done before, and that allows you to shape your invention around, if you're thinking about filing a patent application, to shape your invention around what is known. But again, we recognize there are risks inherent in this if you use that data in the wrong fashion. But I also like to have the legal team conduct what's called a formal prior art search before the filing. So if you have something that you want to file, you write up an invention disclosure, you say, okay, this is what we want to protect. If the legal team goes off and conducts this prior art search, this will be done by uh, special search firms. It could be done by uh, general IP counsels inside house, outside of the house. Uh, then what that tells them is whether it's been done before. And that decision process helps you avoid spending money on patent application preparation, uh, on filing fees, on office action. So again, spending a little bit of money up front to do this prior art search saves you money in the long term uh, by, not, uh, by not chasing goals that cannot be achieved. Thank you, Rick. So our last question uh, from the audience asks, how do we weigh the considerations of patenting versus open source? That is, making something freely available. Yeah, great question. And uh, to this, well, let me actually back up. A lot of times, uh, companies will, early in their intellectual property journey, think that these are orthogonal, uh, orthogonal approaches. And, you know, you're either pro-patent or pro-open source, but that's an overly simplified way of viewing this because many sophisticated technology companies embrace both open source and, uh, and strong patent protections. So in general, if you want to attract others to do things the way that you do it, if you want to build an ecosystem around your approach, around your methodologies, then think about open sourcing them. You want to make them widely available for others to use. But if you have something that's a strong business differentiator, you know, again, we talked about uh, all these different criteria around the business use cases. If you have things that you want to keep for your business solely to practice, 
that's where you should consider strong patent protections, provided, of course, that it meets the criteria that we laid out during the conversation. Again, there's nothing orthogonal about uh, open source versus patenting. You just need to decide when the right approach is to open source versus to patent a given idea. Thank you, Rick. We actually have a, a couple more questions from the audience we just fielded. Uh, explain how does a method patent figure compare with a utility patent? Okay, so you say method patent. Uh, so a method patent is not a specific kind of patent. You know, well, let's go back to say the utility patent can be different things. Um, but there have been a series of cases over the years, and again, I don't want to get into the legalities because I'm not an attorney, but uh, certainly there was a Bilski decision, there was the Alice decision. These have really determined what we can patent when it comes to, to methods. And uh, again, the way I think about this as a technologist is that if you have something that is a pure business method and uh, part of your process becomes, you know, people do A, people do B, people do C. From my experience, the chance of getting a patent on that is very, very, very slim. But if you can say, uh, instead of having the people do these method steps, that these method steps can be automated into software and run on a computational device, as long as those uh, method steps are, again, new, useful, and not obvious, there's a good chance we can get a patent on it. So if you say you want to get a patent on a, on a business method, the first thing I'm going to ask you is whether or not this is something that can be implemented in software and run on a computational device, because that is the kind of technically embodied method that might have a chance of getting a, a strong patent. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, our next question is, what approaches are there for collaborating parties where one party has the idea and the other party is doing the technical development? What options protect each party and lead to successful relationships in your experience? Wow, that is a multifaceted question. How much time do you have on that one? <laughs> so, uh, there are ownership questions and there are inventorship questions that have to be resolved, and you're going to want to work through these with your legal team. And so uh, if I contract you uh, to do some work for me, then I'm going to try to negotiate, and in most uh, instances, I'm going to try to negotiate uh, maintenance of ownership rights for myself. So I'm going to say any IP that's created, I want to own that. And so uh, you, conversely, depending on how much you want my business, you may try to negotiate where you keep the IP created because if you keep the IP that's created, then you can reuse it with other customers as a general rule. Uh, so that's, again, the ownership question, which is hashed out between the legal teams uh, before the contract is signed. There's a separate inventorship question. And, uh, again, legal can help you find the right answer on this. But the way I think about it is uh, whoever has uh, contributed to the uh, claims of the resultant application must be listed as an inventor. And so if I hire you to do some work and I say what I need is for you to come up with a solution that accomplishes X, Y, Z, and you come up with a solution, even if I own the IP, even if I own the rights to the IP, your name may be on the patent because I just gave you a business need and you actually came up with a solution. You devised the inventive steps that make their way into the claims. So your name would be on the patent. Uh, conversely, I may say, we need X, Y, Z in the marketplace. Here's how we're going to accomplish it. Step one, we get this data from these sources. Step two, we perform this transformation. Step three, we merge with this other data. Step four, we share it with the users. I tell you these steps. I give it to you, and I say, go write the code. Now, in this case, regardless of IP ownership rights, I'm probably the inventor because I'm the one that determined the method steps that made their way into the claims. So again, break apart ownership and break apart inventorship. And in each of these cases, uh, the attorneys can help you get to the right answer. The main thing you want to remember is to negotiate IP rights uh, up front and recognize what those IP rights mean to your business if you keep them or if you let them go. Our next question asks, could you please comment on continuation patents? Um, again, you know, we keep going more and more into the, to the, uh, the, the legalities. So there are continuations and continuations in part. Uh, these are often uh, minor modifications to utility patents, and they have different uh, purposes and different roles. Uh, I don't want to go into many details, but again, going back to putting on my business hat, I would say if you have something that has been filed, and you see, for instance, that it's about to be issued as a patent, 
uh, you should ask yourself, are there other permutations? Are there, are there new uh, ways that you might extend this patent beyond what you saw originally with the utility implementation? If the answer is yes, then go back to your legal team and talk about ways that you can extend those legal rights. Again, uh, these are often small, but think of it as the utility patent giving you a primary target in terms of white space of what your business is allowed to do. Think of the continuations of CIPs as being expanding that white space around the, uh, around the area that you've originally patented. And again, it's something that uh, you, know, you go back and look at the value of the patent that's gone forward. And if you say, yeah, this is something that's important to us, then talk to your inventors and talk to your legal team about ways you might extend those rights. Our next question asks, um, how different or, or what degree can a patent application be different from the provisional application? And then related to that, can a, a new invention idea be added to the patent application, which was not mentioned in the original provisional application? You know, I'm going to have to uh, pass on this one. We keep getting further and further into the legalities. And so um, I would uh, tell you to consult with your, your legal team on that. Again, if we think about what the provisional entails, again, it is a very fast placeholder that is going to sketch out the invention at a broader level. And you use this in cases and in times where you need to get something on the books very, very quickly. But beyond that, please work with uh, your inside counsel or outside counsel to flesh out the details. Thank you, Rick. We have and no Tim, further questions. This I have to say about 10 minutes ago, you said our final question was, and I'm, I'm loving to have all these <laughs> questions coming forward. All right, go ahead. I know they keep they keep coming up, Rick. Uh, we really appreciate your time. This has been fantastic, uh, you know, it, to have you here um, and and moderating and, and leading this this panel. We're we're very fortunate. So, at this time, we have no further questions. Uh, this concludes today's webinar. If your question was not answered, or if you would like more information, please visit our website, fusfoundation.org, or email us at info at fusfoundation.org. Thank you all for joining us today and stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations to future webinars. Have a great day. Thank you.